I mean, look, I think at the end of the day, uh, students are looking to acquire as many relevant skills as quickly as possible so that they can, uh, I guess, fulfill the American dream, which now is to become a Silicon Valley darling, <laughs> or at least that's what uh, people assume it's what it's like to be an entrepreneur. The reality of entrepreneurship, of course, is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to get a business off the ground. It takes this concerted effort that most people are not willing to put in. So the ones that end up being successful are the ones that I'm Andre, and this is the Speak Your Life Podcast, where we talk about everything as it relates to education, careers, values, mentors, and anything to do with purpose. We do this one impactful conversation at a time, whether a solo dolo with yours truly or our amazing guest to share stories, industry insights, encouraging words, and calls to action that can help you get closer to your why. Become a part of the Speak Your Life community by subscribing today to the podcast and following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Speak Your L Y F E because life without your why is meaningless. So with me today, I have this dynamic duo. They basically have been doing life together literally since birth. Yes, they're twins and both are econ and finance graduates of Bentley University. They are successful startup specialists and have mentored hundreds of entrepreneurs, are uniquely associated with the prestigious NYU, and now are co-hosts of their podcast, The Mentors, uh, where they share stories and help aspiring business owners get to the next level. Welcome, Sergey and Vadim. Hey, Andre, thanks for having us. Yes, you got it right. We we have been roommates since day one. <laughs> this joke. That's Don't listen to any other podcast with us because I think we say this joke every time. We got to use it every time. That's <laughs> all we have. That's all we have. <laughs> all right, guys, let's let's hear it. For those of... Uh, the people who don't know your life story, let's get that in five minutes. How about that? Sure. Um, so, yeah, our names are probably a little bit weird for most people because we're not born here. <laughs> we were born in Belarus. Uh, and emigrated to this country when we were nine years old with our whole family. I guess we can kind of fast forward to when we already knew English and uh, got to college and realized we wanted to be software engineers only to change our minds about 10 times uh, and then eventually obviously deciding on economics and finance as you mentioned there early on. So uh, since then we've actually been I would say career career changers. Uh, so we've done everything from uh, work in finance to sales, sales engineering, product management, business development. We've worked uh, on our own startups and have been parts of early stage and growth stage startups, uh, both in Boston and New York City. Uh, since then, uh, we've kind of evolved, I guess, because of that and uh, got an opportunity to work in the education space as well. So, Sergey, um, a couple of years, I guess I'll let you speak, Sergey. You have a voice too. We do sound the same. <laughs> we sound the same, so it doesn't actually matter. But, uh, but yeah, I'm on the venture side now, so I'm a venture investor at the NYU Entrepreneurial Institute with the Innovation Venture Fund here where I coach and mentor entrepreneurs at the university through our programs and also invest in some of the most promising ones here at the university. Prior to this, I was at Venture for America running their entrepreneurship programs. Um, and yeah, we love working with early stage entrepreneurs. We ourselves have been early stage entrepreneurs multiple times over, failed many times, have had some successes as well. And now we love uh, paying it forward to other founders and helping them bring their ideas to life. That's our life's passion. Yeah, and it's part of the reason why we got into the education space. I'm a professor at NYU and SUNY Purchase teaching entrepreneurship and management. Um, our father and mother were both in education. My dad was an education reformer in Belarus, mm -hmm. uh, in Lower Ed, but uh, we, I guess, always thought we would somewhat follow in the footsteps and kind of fell into education uh, over the years. And so, yeah, that's, I guess, our story um, in a nutshell in five minutes. Yeah. Wow. We appreciate that. And um, yeah, so I um, I definitely can relate on the educational side. Like my mom was a teacher for about 30 years and just retired last year. So um, definitely we have that connection at least. And so, um, so tell us more about your experience now as a NYU adjunct professor and uh, Sergey as a venture investor for NYU. Uh, share uh, those unique experiences that you guys have uh, with the same university, but just in your own different ways. Sure. Well, higher education is actually changing a lot right now uh, and evolving a lot as well. 
when I was in college, I briefly considered becoming a college professor. And when I realized I'd have to go to school for a bunch of years, get my PhD, uh, basically be a career academic, I kind of stepped away from it thinking that I might become a professor later on in life in my 40s and 50s. But uh, as it happens, uh, I'm fortunate enough that the education space is evolving because people have different needs. Uh, They're realizing that you need uh, a certain set of skills when you get out into the real world that you can apply right away that can be transferable, that allow you to kind of de-risk your career. In other Mm -hmm. words, uh, make sure that if industries change or go away, if there is a recession, you effectively have the skills to handle any situation and have the ability to uh, take on whatever job opportunities are available at any given moment. And because innovation is continuing to expand at a rapid rate, because there are now jobs becoming available and becoming invented essentially uh, at a much faster pace than ever before, education has to evolve to keep pace. And so uh, I got an opportunity to develop and teach a course simply because there's been a renewed interest or I guess a growing interest in entrepreneurship, in learning entrepreneurial skills specifically in higher ed and colleges and universities are looking for practitioners to fill the gap. People that have experience in the field that can then directly uh, teach those skills to students within the university. And so I actually got an opportunity to develop and teach college courses earlier on than I thought, uh, simply because the model changed. Now, higher education institutions are prioritizing not academics, but Mm. uh, practitioners for these specific disciplines. And so I think it's going to continue to evolve, but it's been really interesting to see how NYU, SUNY, and other uh, organizations are reacting to the change in demand and needs from the workforce uh, and people that are just in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would say that... um some universities are doing this successfully and and most are not. Most universities don't know how to teach entrepreneurship, but they're trying to figure it out. NYU, I would say, I think is doing it in one of the best ways. We actually have an entrepreneurship center where I work that uh, works with every student uh, that wants to start a company, whether it's just a dream and idea or something that they're actually putting into action. Um, And so we sit in in a unique place where at least in my role, I get to see entrepreneurs of all types. Yes, I get to invest, which is fun, but uh, I would I would say this job is a lot more fun than a standard venture capital job just because I get to work with founders, even who are not necessarily raising venture money or ever will, but they're starting amazing companies and we have a way to support them here outside of just venture capital. Um, and working with students is, is a pretty exciting just because students have ideas that others wouldn't and they have the naivete to pursue them even if they're hard which is what you want in entrepreneur. So we, we really enjoy working with people from the very early stages, even if it's just an idea to figure out how do I get that first step to making a business a reality? And that's really even what our whole podcast is about, the mentors. It's like that first year in business. How do you get your first couple of customers? How do you get advisors, investors, all of that? That's really the hardest part in the early days. That's, that's really what we specialize in. Yeah. Well, and so... With that being said, um, what would you say would be some of the, I guess, shared characteristics that you see across the board for people who are looking to start businesses like here at NYU? Um, Some characteristics that you notice that are just, I guess, shared amongst many people. Are you talking about from the student's perspective? Yeah, yeah, from the student's perspective. I mean, look, I think at the end of the day, uh, students are looking to acquire as many relevant skills as quickly as possible so that they can... Uh, I guess fulfill the American dream, which now is to become a Silicon Valley darling, <laughs> or at least that's what uh, people assume it's what it's like to be an entrepreneur. The reality of entrepreneurship, of course, is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to get a business off the ground. It takes this concerted effort that most people are not willing to put in. So the ones that end up being successful are the ones that realize that the real education comes from applying what you're learning immediately when you become aware of it. And so I would say from the student's perspective, sometimes it's a lot of of they don't know what they don't know, uh, mm-hmm. but the ones that are able to separate themselves from the pack are the ones that quickly realize that once they uh, acquire a certain set of knowledge or a base minimum set of knowledge, the only way to go deep is to put it into practice right away uh, and experiment. I mean, that's what entrepreneurship is at the end of the day. It's a set of educated guesses and experiments that you can run for as long as possible until you figure out uh, a business that actually generates enough revenue to support you and yeah. uh, the people that you work with. Yeah, I would say the the people that end up being successful 
are always the ones that care more about identifying a problem worth solving than they are married to some dream or idea that they have that they think should exist without you know any validation if they do have something that that's a dream then they go out and prove whether there's demand for that or not but it's the folks that really are are willing to put sort of any fear that they have behind of of actually testing something going to talk to people right getting that validation doing the hard work if you can put that fear aside those are the people that typically end up succeeding and and i think you know you hear the word perseverance but in practice and entrepreneurship what that means is that if the lows are really low you're able mm -hmm. to remove yourself from that and say okay that didn't work now i'm going to try and figure out the next thing and most companies fail because people give up instead of trying to figure out how to make it work or how to find an opportunity that's actually worth solving uh, for working on and so the people that have that persistence are the ones that come out uh, ultimately with successful ventures we find yeah yeah they say that a lot of businesses well most businesses fail within the first uh with three to five years um like 90 percent is kind of crazy but um speaking of uh jobs and things like that um and before you guys became entrepreneurs what would you say like were some career changes that you've had like um i don't know you said you worked a little bit in finance or uh tell us more about like the different career sets that you guys had before leading up to becoming entrepreneurs yeah, so we followed a path that a lot of people do. You know, your parents uh, and people that love you want uh, you to have a secure career mm -hmm. and to follow a certain path that is safe. And we did that for a little bit. We studied finance, and so we decided to get jobs in finance to, uh, again, I guess, kind of provide that padding and make sure that we were on a career path that could be fruitful financially. Mm -hmm. And within a few years of being in finance, we realized that that version of it is not something that we were interested in. Funny enough, obviously, Sergey is a venture investor now, so we are back in finance, just the other side of it. But the way that we backed into uh, roles within uh, the financial field that we actually like is completely different. Mm -hmm. So after the jobs in finance, we wanted to get into tech. We were surrounded by entrepreneurs in college. We tried to start a couple of businesses uh, then as well. Some of them made a little bit of money. A couple of ideas completely flopped. But we knew that that was exciting for us. And so while we were both in finance, actually, we had the same exact job out of college. That's why I say we, we decided after passing level one of the CFA exam, Charter Financial Analyst exam, that we did not want to become investment managers. And so startups was the natural next step since we wanted to get back into an exciting realm around innovation. And within startups, we knew that there were really one of two things we could do. We could work on the sales slash customer acquisition side or on the product side, right? You're really mm -hmm. either building the product or getting customers for it. Those were the two main functions, especially early on, but even as a company involves if you think about any role that's within a startup, it's typically either operational or customer acquisition focused where you're supporting the business or getting revenue for it, or you're actually creating the product, that good or service that somebody needs. And we knew that it's much harder to acquire computer software skills to build product, even though we did have somewhat of a CS background, having pursued that mm -hmm. major early on in our careers, but that sales is a skill that would always be needed. And that's one thing that we always tell people. It's a career that we both pursued. We had several jobs in sales. We can obviously go into more depth with that. But that was the right decision, I think, that we made because getting that skill early on gave us a transferable skill that could apply to almost any industry and uh, many jobs even. So my next job after sales was sales engineering, which was essentially technical sales. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't get that job unless you have customer facing experience, same with business development roles, even product roles to a certain extent. Um, so I would say for us, uh, sales and going into that direction, acquiring that skill is a really important decision. And we recommend that to anybody that doesn't know what they want to do, it's a good skill to pick up even if you don't think you're good. At it you can develop it yeah yeah I mean we've we've both had a few careers and I'll say that I mean we've been in the in the job market for about 10 years since we graduated and we probably switched careers three or four times um, I think the way we've been able to do it is by getting experience the sort of a different new type of experience while we're still in one career mm -hmm. to be able to level up and leverage that experience to get into the new thing so when when we wanted to go from finance to sales 
the way that I got the sales job is I was able to point to a startup that I started in college where we sold our car and you know we did cold calls and tried to generate sales that way. That startup didn't succeed, but I could say I did cold calls in college. Yeah. So I can probably right. figure out how to do sales for you, for Redeem. Mm -hmm. He ended up working for our cousin's startup for free after work, making cold calls from 5 to 8 p.m. Uh, to the West Coast from the East Coast so that yeah. he didn't have to eat into work time. And he just offered our cousin to work for free. So it was a no-brainer for him, even though he didn't have experience. It's, you know, he doesn't care if, if he can teach his cousin how to do some sales after work and maybe get some free sales out of that, free revenue out of that. Mm -hmm. So we figured out how to get leverage those free or low-paying opportunities on nights and weekends or even our own projects mm -hmm. to then level up and, and do the next thing. Same with sales engineering, right? But you, you taught yourself, I think, basic HTML and JavaScript, and, and we put together some WordPress sites. We were trying to start another business, and I'll, that's another thing that I'll say is that any business that you start, it doesn't even matter if it succeeds. You're going to learn so many skills for that that you can leverage it to get another job. So that's how we got into more technical roles is we built product ourselves. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter how successful it was. If you can get users for a product on a minimal budget, Mm -hmm. That's going to be attractive to some companies. Yeah. So that's how we yeah. leveraged to get into product roles. We got into venture because we started companies and you know leveled up to mentoring at accelerators and then running accelerators. And then that gave us the credibility to get into venture capital, which then gave us the credibility to become writers. And now we write for Forbes and Harvard Business Review because we started creating content for ourselves and we could point to a portfolio of good content. So there's always a way to get into a new industry if you can figure out how to get very valuable experience in a short period period of time mm -hmm. that you can point to that's attractive to others and credible to others. Always a way. Um, you don't necessarily have to spend $100,000 going to school or grad school just to change careers. The BBC reports that U.S. workers' online studies said that nearly 70% agree public speaking skills are critical for success at work. Maybe you are a student looking to become a prime candidate for that internship or might I say full-time position. Or maybe you have already been in the job market for some time now and you just want to stand out amongst your coworkers looking to get that raise you feel like you've been passed up for for too long now. Go to speakyourlife.com slash private dash lessons. That's speakyourlife.com slash private dash lessons. Again, that's speakyourlyfe.com slash private dash lessons to become a better communicator tomorrow by signing up today. Yeah, yeah. And I definitely, uh, I can at least say that I've had that experience of sharing that entrepreneurial mindset with my brother. Uh, growing up, like as kids, we had our own lawn care service and car washing business in the neighborhood. And we were those kids who had the professional equipment and undercut all the other guys who were more quote unquote professional. And so we had that experience just growing up. And even though we, we've had many failures, ups and downs and things like that, but it was sh such a good experience. Um, and, and that's one thing that I can relate with you guys on that sense. But and, and, and that kind of leads me to my other question of like, how did you manage to just do business together? Because I know there's so many families that, you know, they're close together, but when it comes to business and money, oh no, that's, that's not even an option. Um, how do you guys manage to be able to work together, be brothers and be, you know, be loving and, and also just be about your business and the sense of like, you're treating each other like business partners, but you're also realizing the importance of your relationship. Well, I think we're in a little bit unique situation because we are twins, identical twins. We've worked on a lot of projects together. I mean, literally from school projects to obviously entrepreneurial ventures since college. And so, you know, I, I would say that it's really subjective. Uh, a lot of co-founding teams actually start with friends working together. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly a lot of examples of families starting together, right? I think Five Guys Burgers was, was a whole family business, basically, that started yeah. off and then expanded, right? And so there, there actually are countless examples of siblings and families own businesses that operate really well. It just depends on the relationship that you have with your family and if you can operate a business together. So, you mm -hmm. know, we have other older brothers that we could work on other things with, but maybe a business would not be that thing. It would be different projects that, that we're, cap we're able to work with them 
them on. Same with certain friends. Certain friends I can work on businesses with. Certain friends I just love being friends with. There's no reason for us to work on a business together. So yeah. <laughs> it depends on your relationship. You know, we have a certain level of trust. I think because we're twins, we know that we can be blunt with each other. You know, we can have a disagreement or even a, a, a little fight about something, but that we will quickly get through it because we know that the well-being or the ultimate goal of whatever it is we're focusing on is the priority for both of us. And also we know uh, little things like, oh, wait, we're not going to screw each other because we actually care about uh, maintaining the relationship, uh, both professional and personal and, and, and you know, family uh, love type of thing, right? It's important for us. And so mm -hmm. you can make it work, but obviously it's very subjective and you have to be sensitive to uh, each different situation. I yeah. would say that the number one thing, whether you're working with your siblings or your best friends or just a random person who became a co-founder, is alignment. And mm -hmm. for us, it, it took, you know, we've worked, been working on things together since we were 19, so we could get to that alignment. Over time, we figured out how to work together, and we figured out that we have similar goals. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as you establish those goals and you establish a way to communicate and get decisions made and you have sort of a mutual respect and, 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 and understanding of what you're trying to build together also respect for the fact that a company is hard and you have to be fully committed then you can have that great co-founder relationship regardless of who it is and it could be great to do it with a sibling if you have that trust but you know there's some siblings that i mean we have some brothers that we probably wouldn't work with even though we love them and we respect them as professionals and they do great work uh, we know that that kind of co-founder relationship just for us wouldn't necessarily work mm -hmm. with those siblings, but you just kind of have to be honest with yourself and test that too if yeah. you can. And one thing I'll add is that even for Sergey and I, it's a constantly evolving thing. Just like if you have a co-founder that you start a business with, you know, a business changes a year in or six months in, a year in, three, five years. And so you need to constantly be in communication with your partners, even if it's your siblings, uh, about the work. Uh, and that relationship can evolve uh, and it's okay for it to evolve because things change, people change, priorities change, uh, your personal life affects it oftentimes as well. And mm -hmm. so as long as Sergey said the expectations are set from the beginning and are continually reset if needed, uh, you can avoid a lot of issues. Okay, good, good. And so um, that's really that's really good and I, I definitely admire the kind of work that you guys have together and uh, what you're able to accomplish together. Um, and so that's really great. And I think a lot of people can learn from that. And so there's a lot of people out there also that just, I don't know, they live by this concept of what I do is all of who I am. And that I feel like that you guys can talk a little bit about that because you know you guys are more than just business partners you guys are more than just entrepreneurs more than just venture capitalists and you know adjunct professors you are you know brothers you're you know your um, family um, and friends and more than that so how do you speak to people who I don't know they sometimes they I guess they wrap their whole identity in their career or you know they take all their pride in just being a businessman or they don't know how to be a family person or a good friend or anymore how do you speak to that well I would say I mean look uh, it it's human nature to place labels on ourselves and others mm -hmm. uh, it's almost uh, imposed upon us because every time you meet somebody new one of the first questions is what do you do right and so you kind of have to have an answer for that but I think as for us anyways as we've evolved as we've gotten uh, into different career paths that elevator pitch that story is always changing mm -hmm. and so I think it's okay to have a narrative it's okay to have uh, a label even if, if that makes it easier for somebody to understand what your story is at a given time but for people like us who have a bunch of skills a bunch of interests are jacks of all trades uh, and I think actually all of us have more than one thing that we're good at so even people that are really narrow and have a very specific job or set of skills or they assume they do they I would think would find out pretty quickly if they explored other areas that they have other skills so I would say that as long as you keep an open mind to the fact that your label can constantly change and evolve and whatever narrative you have for yourself isn't something that is strict 
Uh, it's not something that's fixed or absolute. You can change it any day uh, mm-hmm. and start practicing a different narrative. I think if you get used to that mantra of uh, defining yourself differently to other people, then you'll slowly pull away from any one label for yourself. So obviously that's subjective. Uh, it kind of starts with awareness and even a desire to do that. Mm-hmm. But um you know, for us now, I, I guess we work with a lot of real estate entrepreneurs, and that's generally where our time is spent and our discipline has gone. But I know in six months it could be completely different, and the story can be adjusted, and that's fine because you are more than just that one thing. Yeah, it's it is it is that's I definitely would agree to that. It adjusts, and it you know it's also what you want. Like some people, they want to be good at one thing and recognize about one specific area and go deep, and that's all they want, and that's how they want to present themselves, and that's all they care about. For us, we've always had unique interests, and I mean, even when we started our podcast a year and a half ago, six months into it, we started writing for these different publications. We took over a podcast meetup where now we have about 850 members in the meetup that meets every couple of months. And so we started being seen as podcast experts, even though we had only been in the industry at that point for like six months, but we Mm -hmm. learned enough in a short period of time and we got enough visibility in a short period of time where that was now a new expertise that we could put on our resume and talk about extensively and help others with extensively and can continue if we want to do. So for us, that's part of what's unique and interesting about life and especially life in New York City is that you can take any interest that you have and do it at the highest maximum level and grow very very quickly and become an expert and we love doing that over and over again um, you know mm-hmm. we, we've both done music and acting and improv and we've performed in some amazing places and so there's just we just like a lot of different stuff and that's how we choose to represent ourselves and lead our lives I will say though for most people It's not just the work. It's their personal relationship. It's the relationships. It's their families, friends. It's traveling. It's learning. Whatever it is. And I think for those people uh, being aware of the fact that there are many different aspects to life that excite you uh, and giving yourself a break and realizing that it's okay to allocate your time on those things as well, even if they're not, let's say, money-making because the rest of the world judges us based on uh, money, uh, then I think that'll make things a little bit easier because you're you realize, well, you know, I'm not living for anybody else but myself. And so if I want to mm-hmm. define, uh, spend my time in certain areas because it makes me happy, then by all means, there's no reason to feel guilt about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, all right. So there's a lot of people out there that feel just stuck. They just feel um, stuck at what they're doing and um, they don't know how to get out. Any practical information uh, you would offer to people or just stuck in their education with was picking a major or people who are in the job market they're just they hate their jobs and they just want to get out yeah i think this one can be pretty quick and easy Uh, whenever we feel stuck or we want to change the best thing you could do is get out of your current environment more specifically get out there and meet people that think differently than you so if that means Even going to a dance class, literally, because you don't usually go and you want to meet people that are interested in dance or learning a new language, right? Taking some language classes and and meeting people that want to absorb different cultures. Or if it's more on the professional side, go to networking events or industry-specific events in your city and, again, meet people within those fields. When you go out there and meet new people that have a different outlook on life, that look through the world through a different lens, you become aware of more opportunities. You start seeing things in a different light. And oftentimes having a few conversations with people on the outside, in other words, people from outside of your network can reinvigorate you and uh, awaken new motivations without you. They can point you in a new direction. Uh, Sometimes it can literally even translate into new opportunities if you meet somebody at the right time. So I would say that should be your first step. Uh, It's the best use of your time and it's very easy to do. It can just take one evening uh, or one evening a week consistently for a month, for example, for you to start seeing some benefits from that. So if you feel stuck, uh, it's probably because you haven't exposed yourself to new people in a while. So just get out there, start meeting new folks, Mm -hmm. and you probably will feel unstuck even that day, but if not that day, relatively quickly after. Yeah. And for a lot of people, you may not have people in your life, friends and family, or even significant other who necessarily understand your dream or what you're trying to pursue. So if you can't get that at home, or through your friends, you have to go out and find that elsewhere. Find those people that are doing something similar 
so that you know they can push you and motivate you by what they're doing, right? And 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 they're going to provide a completely different perspective because they're going to help you embrace your ideas and and push yourself further versus someone else who might see what you're doing as too risky or it doesn't make sense or it's not conventional. You don't need those naysayers in your life. You you kind of need to you know nod and then move on, ignore that, and go talk to people that are actually going to encourage you. All right, uh, we got just a couple more questions, and we'll be out of here. Um, the one before that, the last one will be, yeah, what's one thing when it comes to what you value that your house stands on? Um, well, uh, for me, it, it again goes back to relationships. I would say that is the one foundation that you have uh, that is harder to break than anything else and something that you can lean on when anything goes wrong. So if you're fortunate enough to have supportive family and friends, that is really what I think for all of us, what our house stands on. Uh, But again, if that's not something that you really have because, well, of bad luck or because you haven't invested the time into it, it is something that can change and can change on any dime. You know, I've developed best friendships uh, at times, at difficult times that kind of seem to come out of nowhere, but because I was open to meeting those new people, it literally changed things uh, entirely for me. So I would say uh, when in doubt, focus on relationships because that can kind of be a guiding light for you. For me, I would say that the number one principle, at least lately, that's been most helpful is to try to step out of constantly thinking about the future or dwelling in the past and focus on what am I getting done today toward where I want to be. Um, today is really the only day that you can control, and that actually helps you cope with the other days that are really high with exciting things happening and really low with sad things happening. And pretty much every couple of months, there's one of those that occurs, and the only way you make through it is by focusing on on the current day. And for me as well, part of that is, like Vadim said, always making time for people nothing really matters if you don't have people involved whether it's your team your customers your friends so if there's someone that comes to me for help or advice or just wants you know to lend an ear or wants me to lend an ear I'm always going to make myself available because in the end of the day no matter what my personal goals are I need to be able to make myself available to others uh, and and provide value for them because that's paramount to, to everything else without them nothing else really exists whether it's a business or a career or anything else all right cool and the very last question of the day is the question of the day of this segment where we just ask a random question to get to know you guys better if you got to sing with anybody on a stage who would it be Justin Timberlake, uh, always love JT. I think me and him can also break down a couple of moves on the dance floor too. Well, he'll have to choreograph it for me. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> I think so. He's a great entertainer. Love him. He's good. I, I think that next to him, though, we would look pretty nerdy. Uh, or maybe not. Maybe we would, <laughs> no, but, if we could choreograph. I don't think so. If we could choreograph with him, and we both have similar length beards, then maybe we can look okay. Um, I would probably say Taylor Swift, uh, ah, that's just a good one. because in case, in case she's single, she can write a song about me. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. After we break up. <laughs> all right guys well thank you so much for being here with me on this episode um everybody be sure to subscribe again to the podcast to get content and check us out on instagram um and also follow their podcast at the mentors you can find that at the mentors that's the mentors.co again that's the mentors.co Thank you again, guys, for listening to this episode. And again, be sure to subscribe and we will see you next time. Thanks, Andre.